Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. This is the track left in the sand by the nesting female. This is what we're looking for when we're patrolling. So we're trying to restore this property back to a native prairie state. This should be a tall grass prairie that's going to have a diverse plant community. I love doing research underwater because it's such a complex and fascinating environment. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. I love working and living around the ocean. The sound of the surf, looking out into the ocean, I can't imagine being anywhere else. I am Dr. Donna Shaver, and I lead the Kempsterly Sea Turtle Recovery Project here at Padre Island National Seashore. Kemp's Ridley is an endangered species that was almost obliterated within just a blink of an eye and it became endangered because of human activities. And it's gonna take human activities to help conserve that animal and to keep it on this planet for the future. There's still a long way to go to recover the population of the Kempsworthy sea turtle. There was a film that was made in 1947 that showed an estimated 40,000 Kemp's Ridley's nesting at Rancho Nuevo on just one day. By the time that biologists went to the nesting beach to try to investigate, the number of Kemp's Ridley's nesting had already plummeted due to the loss of eggs, due to intentional taking of the eggs from the nesting beach, as well as loss of the juveniles and adults due to fisheries operations. The Kemp's Ridley population continued to decline to a low of only 702 nests worldwide for 1985. A project was started as a safeguard against extinction so that if a political or environmental catastrophe occurred at Rancho Nuevo, there'd be a safe area in the U.S. where Kemp's Ridley's could nest and be protected. From 1978 to 1988, 22,507 Kemp's Ridley sea turtle eggs were brought to Padre Island National Seashore for incubation in an attempt to establish a secondary nesting colony because Kemp's Ridley is a native nester to South Texas. What we tried to do was to imprint the turtles to Padre Island National Seashore. The hatchlings were released on the beach, allowed to crawl into the surf where they were recaptured using aquarium dip nets. Then the hatchlings were sent to the National Marine Fishery Service Laboratory in Galveston, Texas, where they were raised for approximately nine to 11 months. And that allowed the turtles to grow to a size large enough so that they could be tagged for future recognition and also to be able to avoid most predators when they were released. And that's a big turtle. It's about three feet long. And it took a full 10 years before we found our first confirmed returnee from that project. And it was an extremely happy day. Look at her. We knew that these turtles were from the project because they had on them living tags. A living tag is like a skin graft where there was a piece of the bottom shell taken out, a piece of the top shell, and that small plug from the bottom shell was glued into the surrounding shell surface on the top providing a permanent light identification marker on the darker background of the top shell. Okay, there's the egg cavity with the eggs. So there's about 100. This is very significant for us in that we've got the first 
uh, documented evidence of a sea turtle of any species that's been experimentally imprinted to a particular area to return to that area to nest. Oh, I love this job. We're looking for sea turtle tracks primarily. We're looking for those nesting turtles. We go for their eggs and we bring them into the hatching facility. We got six nests my first year and now to get a day when we get 19 in one day is just, it's so exciting. I can't tell you how much it means. It's nice to know that we'll be able to pass through this life and leave the earth a little bit better place than it was when we got here. This is the track left in the sand by the nesting female. This is what we're looking for when we're patrolling. As you can see, it's about a foot and a half to two feet wide, and there's scuff marks from the flippers and little divots in the sand that are made from the nails on the flippers as the turtle crawls up the beach or back down into the water. Nesting Kemp's Ridley sea turtles are only on the beach for about 45 minutes. She lays the eggs. They come out in one or two or three at a time. They provide no maternal care for their eggs and don't return to the nest site. When the turtle is done, she will cover that nest cavity and she returns to the sea. It's very important that you watch carefully for Nesting Kemp's Ridley turtles they are very slow, and they can't move to avoid an approaching vehicle. This is a species that's been around for four million years. I feel like we've got an obligation to try to bring this species back so that it can be enjoyed by future generations. We work so hard to find Kempsterly nests on the Texas coast. Sometimes, despite hours of digging and of probing, we're unable to find the nest and protect those eggs. So when possible, we call in the expert sniffer, my Karen Terrier Ridley, who we've trained to aid with nest detection. Find the nest, Ridley. When we bring Ridley to his site, he aggressively sniffs on the beach trying to find where that nest is located, and he really enjoys doing this. Find that nest, Ridley. Where's that nest? And the little dog, we could have spent five hours probing and digging, bring him in, and within a matter of just minutes, he locates the nest. Where's the nest? Oh, good boy, Ridley. You found it. You found it. Oh, good boy. The eggs are collected from all of the nests that we find on the Texas coast and brought in for protected incubation. The incubation temperature determines whether the turtles will be male or female. Warmer temperatures produce females, cooler temperatures males. We try to hatch mostly females so that they'll have a better chance of reproduction in the wild. During the day of the release, the turtles are immediately brought down to the beach and they're placed on the beach and allowed to enter the surf and go free. These animals are, are pretty primitive animals and basically are working on instinct right now. Um, smelling the salt air, hearing the waves probably, and just making a mad dash towards the water to try to get in there as quickly as they can. They're free and they're going to be on this uh, journey that's going to last their whole lifetime. After many years of hard work by many people, both in Mexico and the United States, the Kemp's Ridley population is increasing. For the future, we're going to have to continue our very hard work. 
This is an endangered species success story in the making. This is one of the last great habitats along the Texas coast. It was a ranch of many seasons. It will be preserved forever now. I never get tired of coming here. You don't see a lot of native coastal prairie anymore. Yeah, the Powderhorn, you know, the name is just so evocative and the place lives up to it, you know, from the sprawling live oaks to the miles of frontage along Matagorda Bay and the bountiful fish and game and water birds and waterfowl and redfish and trout. It's just absolutely magical. It's a sportsman's paradise and something that every outdoors enthusiast can enjoy. You know, people care passionately about their coast um, and they want to see it conserved, but they also want to have access to it. And so as we think about conserving what makes our coastal heritage and lands and waters so special, but also being able to provide managed access for fishing and hunting and canoeing and kayaking and bird watching and hiking and nature viewing is just a, an extraordinary opportunity. And the Powderhorn offers that like no other. The Powderhorn Ranch has been the dream of the conservation community for almost a quarter of a century. And everybody has recognized its scale, its incredible ecological integrity and biological uniqueness. And really fish and wildlife biologists have thought of it as one of the last great places along the coast. And this adds to a big network and complex of lands that are already protected for conservation as part of the Aransas National Wildlife Refuge and Matagorda Island. And it's, it's kind of the hole in the donut. What a rich history that the Powderhorn provides in our state, really from the time of Native Americans that were hunting and fishing and living on the banks of Matagorda Bay, all the way up to the earliest European settlers that came ashore in and around this area, to uh, the German settlers that came by there and landed the historic ports that were established near there, and of course the ranching heritage in the area, and the Denman family that ranched Powderhorn for almost a century. My husband's family, his grandfather, Judge Denman, sat on the Supreme Court of Texas. He bought the Powderhorn Ranch with his son, Leroy Denman, so it came into the hands of my husband Leroy Denman, Jr., to ranch for some 65 years. And it was simply a love affair to encourage and to grow and to make better what he had been asked to oversee. How grateful Leroy would be if he were alive today. He wanted very much to pass it on leaving land for the future. We've been ranching since the 80s, and we came to the Powderhorn about 12 years ago. What a, what a treasure. If you love your job, it's not work. And that's the way we feel about the ranch. Great place to raise kids and, and a family. Well, you always worry about development of a place like this. And I know from experience, from being here, when people have come to look at it, to uh, build plants and industry on it, 
And so that was my biggest worry is, you know, it'd go to development instead of staying like this. You know, it's just preserving what's here. I think that's a, just a win for everyone. So we're trying to restore this property back to a native prairie state. This should be a tall grass prairie that's gonna have a diverse plant community. And in turn, that plant community is gonna support a diverse uh, bird community. Powderhorn is a unique place because it hasn't been divided into smaller ranches. It's still an intact tract of native tall grass prairie. There's less than 5% of tall grass prairie left in the United States. A lot of the areas are built up in homes, uh, industry, farmland, rangeland, and you don't see a lot of just open native grassland. Obviously, this running live oak is too thick for animals to utilize. In the absence of fire, the running live oak has grown up into these thick moths. Our intent is to use herbicide and prescribed fire to knock it back and get back to a native prairie state. So birds are gonna be the main animal that's gonna benefit from this restoration. Uh, a lot of imperiled birds, like grassland nesting birds, but also uh, Oplomato falcons and whooping cranes are gonna benefit from this restoration. The majority of this property is gonna be a wildlife management area where we'll be able to do habitat management, have public hunts, but the, the, most of the time it's gonna be an outdoor research laboratory. Uh, the state park is gonna to cater more towards uh, the daily use visitors that come out, uh, maybe camp. There'll be access to shoreline fishing, uh, walking trails, hiking trails, biking trails. Right now, we are designing research studies, uh, setting up public hunt programs, and getting, overall getting ready to where the public can come out and enjoy this property. We couldn't have done the Powderhorn Ranch project without the Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation. This is a very entrepreneurial, innovative, public-private partnership. Really the, the precedent for the future. And certainly a public entity couldn't do this by itself. Thanks to the extraordinary efforts of the Parks and Wildlife Foundation who put together this public-private partnership with huge seed funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundations, the Nature Conservancy and the Conservation Fund who were able to help put the deal together and many donations from a wide variety of donors, big and small, we were able to see this dream realized. I sang Oh, I thank the Texas Parks and Wildlife and those private sector donors that have been so gracious to make this possible. We have a lot of work to do ahead of us, but it's good work, it's rewarding work, and it's gonna help chart the course for what undoubtedly is gonna be one of the most iconic and flagship properties within the state's public land system. These are the proverbial trees that we're planting so that somebody else can enjoy their shade. Uh, and if we wouldn't take these kind of risks, we wouldn't have any more state parks for our growing public to enjoy. Paderhorn is going to be one of those places that we look back on for generations to come, and we're going to thank goodness that we had the courage and the foresight to acquire this place. Voracious, intense, and hungry, the Dermestid beetles are very effective at what they do. But don't worry, they're no threat to you unless you find yourself in a bat cave. I definitely don't want to fall when I'm in the cave now. <laughs> if I fell in here and, uh, you know, like broke my leg or something, what would, uh, what would happen? And I don't know. <laughs> I don't really want to find out. <laughs> Thank you.
The back beach is back well away from the water line. Different kind of critters live back here, and one of the most important ones shows us evidence of his little house right here with this mound of sand and a little hole. And we're gonna dig down there and see if we can uncover this little ghost crab that lives in this little burrow. He sits down there in nice air-conditioned comfort all day long, waiting for the next night. And there we go. Here he is. Look who lives down in the burrow, a ghost crab. One of the neatest little critters on the back beach. Neat little exoskeleton colored just like the sand. Look at those beautiful little periscope eyes pop up and down. Got neat little pockets there to put the eyes down when he goes in the burrow. They're basically a scavenger. They feed on most anything live or dead they can run across. But they're also little predators. They know how to get clams and little fish and things in the surf. And we're ready now to turn him loose and let him go back home. The world's oceans are the last frontier on this earth. And I love being underwater. And I've always dove ever since I was little. So every time I go, it's just a thrill each and every time. I love doing research underwater because it's such a complex and fascinating environment. The basis of my research is to take photographs of the coral and to compare that to photographs I took at the Flower Gardens, which is the coral reef right off the coast of Texas, and try to see what's similar and what's different about the two sites. The practice or art of calling wild game is the uh, simple activity of going out and reproducing a sound that uh, occurs naturally in the outdoors anyway. You're right in the middle of that. It's incredible. Many nocturnal animals don't see the color red very well at night. So Gerald uses this to his advantage. Then, if they stay around, he gradually removes the color. During the nesting season, the male screech owl retrieves and brings a bug back to the mother and the fledglings on average of every 30 seconds. Do you imagine the amount of work he's got to do in a night? They live on uh, moths and lizards and June bugs and all kinds of little things. Well, he's sticking around a long time. There's no magic, just the good use of a few sounds and a lot of time recording them. I looked up in this tree, and uh, there was a bear in the tree. So I'll go in and tell my wife. She didn't believe me, of course. She had to come out and look. Good shot. Well, he'll go down in a minute. He's in a perfect tree, because he'll just hit those branches, and it'll break his fall all the way down. We're going to attempt to drop him down. <laughs> you ready? Hang on. That's a big bear. Oh. OK, I need tip of his nose right on the tip, right down the middle center of his back. We need more tape. <laughs> We put the tracking collars on these bear because we want to determine their home ranges and compare it to other studies in the United States. Uh, I expect us to find some pretty exciting information out. And uh, without the tracking collars, we wouldn't know as much about what was going on, <laughs> especially about individual animals. Collars plenty loose. He's snoring. <laughs> he'll wake up, he'll be really groggy. and. He's not really a problem bear. Uh, he didn't do any damage or tear anything up. We really moved him for his protection, not for people's protection. 